Good day, we are the TMC3 and we will be presenting our case analysis number 2 in hematology regarding lead poisoning. So let us now start in our introduction and in our case 2. Lead poisoning occurs when lead accumulates in the body over time, up 10 months or years. Even trace amounts of lead can be hazardous to oneself. Children under the age of 6 are especially vulnerable to lead poisoning which can have a serious consequences for their mental and physical development. Lead poisoning can be fatal at high concentrations. So let us now move on with our differential diagnosis of the case. And these are the differential diagnosis. First is the Attention Deficit Disorder or ADHD. It's one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorder of childhood. It is usually first diagnosed in childhood and often lasts into adulthood. Children with ADHD may have trouble paying attention, controlling impulsive behavior, and may act without thinking about what will be the result of their actions or be overly active, which can also be correlated with this case because upon early examination, their child has had been difficulty paying attention in class over past few months. Next is the lead poisoning or lead toxicity, which is most, much likely the diagnosis because of the signs and symptoms that child elicits. Next is iron deficiency anemia, a condition in which blood lacks adequate healthy red blood cells. We also put petal alcohol syndrome into consideration as well as thyroid disorder, which is variety of disorder that can result in the gland producing too little thyroid hormone and hyper Calcemia. We also put in consideration the pituitary disorder and may also consider vision or hearing impairments. And finally, the complete blood count findings will help narrow this differential as well as the signs and symptoms that is present in the patient. And the final diagnosis of this case will be discussed by Ibona Georgi. What is most likely diagnosis in this child? Lead toxicity may be the initial diagnosis to this child, causing the following signs and symptoms, including increased irritability, vague abdominal complaints, lower growth during a one year period, and most significantly, the microcytic hypochromic anemia with basophilic stippling. Early detection of this head disease can be well until dangerous amounts have been accumulated, so the physician must maintain continuous watch to the patient until a laboratory test is used to confirm if it's really a lead poisoning. There are multiple risk factors for lead poisoning, such as leaded gasoline and paints, imported items such as toys, furniture, ceramic, crystal ware, traditional medicines and spices, also employers who work in the mining, metallurgy, construction, battery manufacturing, or recycling industries can run the risk of unintentionally bringing lead containing dirt back to their own houses. Lead can leak into drinking water as well through copper or lead soldered copper pipes which is used to transport water. Another risk factor is age. Infants and young children are more likely to be exposed to lead than the older children. Also, living in an older home or buildings often retain remnants of these lead containing paints. Another risk factor is include cosmetics and also living in developing countries because developing countries often have a less strict rules regarding exposure to lead than 
the developed country have. Other less common risk factors include artists making stained glass artifacts or windows as this requires lead soldering. For number five, what organ systems can be involved with this disorder? Lead can have a serious consequences for the health of children. At high level of exposure, lead attacks the brain and can affect every organ system. But of all the organ systems, the nervous system is the mostly affected target in lead toxicity, both in children and adults. The toxicity in children is, however, of a greater impact than in adults. This is because their tissues, internal as well as external, are softer than in adults. Lead toxicity can cause coma, convulsions, and even death. The skeletal system is also affected. It may show increased radiodensities at the ends of the long bones at the metapysis. The urinary system may also show chronic tubular interstitial disease over time with high lead levels. Lead exposure has also been associated with an increased incidence of clinical cardiovascular endpoints such as coronary heart disease, stroke, and peripheral arterial disease, and with other cardiovascular function of normalities such as left ventricular hypertrophy and alterations in cardiac rhythm. For number four, describe the diagnostic hallmarks of this condition. The hematologic system is one of the more prevalent systems implicated with lead poisoning where anemia, red blood cells with basophilic stippling, and ring sideroblast can be seen on bone marrow evaluation. Microcytic hypochromic anemia is one of the most frequently encountered in these cases. However, this is likely due to the other factors such as iron deficiency. The formation of ring sideroblast is linked to the formation of iron-laden mitochondria in red blood cell precursors as a result of lead suppression of ferrochelatase. Lead is a pervasive environmental toxin that may broth numerous chronic, acute, circulatory, neurological, hematological, gastrointestinal, reproductive, and immunological disorders. It is a heavy metal that can bind to proteins and potentially alter how they function. In cellular process, lead competes with other minerals, particularly the calcium and zinc. As a result, it interferes with number of cellular activities that rely on these minerals. Many calcium binding proteins show greater affinity or stronger affinity to lead than in calcium. This may have variety of outcomes. For instance, lead can interfere with release of neurotransmitters. This is a calcium-dependent process. And for our conclusion, even low levels of lead exposure can cause long harm, particularly in children. The greatest danger is to the brain development, which can result in irreversible damage. Higher levels can harm both children and adults, kidney and nervous systems, seizure and constant death, and death may result from extremely high lead levels. And these are the simple measures that can help protect your children from lead poisoning. First, wash your hands and toys. To help reduce hand to mouth transfer of contaminated dust or soil, wash your children's hands after outdoor play, before eating, and bedtime. Wash their toys regularly. Eat healthy diet. Regular meals, good nutrition, might help lower lead absorption. Children especially need enough calcium, vitamin C, and iron in their diets to help keep lead from being absorbed. Remove shoes before entering the house. This will help keep lead-based soil outside. Prevent children from playing in soils because children can get lead poisoning and soils. And keeping home well-maintained. If your home has lead-based paint, Check regularly for peeling paint and fix problem promptly. 
try not to sound which generate dust particles that contain lead.